Okay, great. So I'm going to talk to you guys about something a little different today than, than what I normally talk about. Um, we've, been ta we've been working uh, together with Dinesh Bharatia a lot on some Wi-Fi backscatter stuff, which I've talked about at previous uh, CWC meetings. Today I'm going to talk about two different topics that are I think will be of high interest to, to the audience here. So if we look at the application spaces that we're playing in, we're trying to build good low power radio transmitters for two different kind of applications. One is short range applications. We can think of these as wearables, smart home kind of capabilities and so on. And the other sort of application is more longer range things, smart cities, animal tracking, you know, things like this. Now in the first case, we're really stuck with basically two communication standards, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. And they work pretty well but not quite well enough for the future that we envision. In the long range case, we actually don't have a lot of good solutions for this because we really have to rely on our cellular infrastructure. And I would argue that in both cases, the power consumption of the radios is too high to enable the kind of applications that we're looking to build. Okay, Bluetooth low energy, despite the words low and energy being in the title of the standard, is not actually that low energy, okay? So we're trying to look at alternative ways that we can enable wireless communication within the confines of the standards, but making it much lower power than it already is today. So to that end, we've been doing, uh, as I mentioned, a lot of work on things like uh, Wi-Fi, uh, how do I get this to work? Wi-Fi compatible backscatter hardware. This is a project in collaboration with Dinesh Bharatia in the back of the room here. And what we've shown is we can communicate with commodity Wi-Fi hardware at a thousand times lower power simply by receiving Wi-Fi packets, modulating them in a very specialized way uh, at, at, the impedance, uh, at the antenna impedance level. So we're not doing any active RF amplification. There's no RF PLLs or anything like this. And we can re-radiate these, these modulated Wi-Fi packets back to a different phone or access point or something like this for full commodity uh, compliant communication. So we started that, that technique uh, in 2020. Since then, we've had a number of papers. Uh, uh, we'll have our fourth paper at ISSCC this year uh, on this topic related to integrating Bluetooth into this and so on. And in addition, we've also been doing things like wake up receivers. How can we wake up to Bluetooth and Wi-Fi signals? And we've shown we can do this with something like four microwatts of power. Okay, so we can wake up to Bluetooth and Wi-Fi with four microwatts of power. We can communicate with Bluetooth and Wi-Fi at uh, tens of microwatts of power with standard compatible hardware. So what we're going to show in, in February uh, of next year is a way that we can do a single device interrogation system. So basically, you take your phone, you wave it within the vicinity of your, of your tag you're trying to interrogate. The tag will harvest LTE signals from the phone. It'll take in a Bluetooth signal and translate it back as a Wi-Fi signal right back to your phone. So we're really envisioning this for, for applications like smart warehouses, asset tracking, uh, things like this I, I, we're, we're very, very excited about. OK, so that's kind of the usual stuff that I talk about at, at these uh, sessions. What I want to talk about today is privacy. OK, this is another project we're working on with uh, Dinesh Bharatia as well as Aaron Schulman in our computer science department. And it turns out that we're all in this room here. We all have phones and watches and AirPods and all of this stuff. And all of them are just blasting out advertisement packets on Bluetooth continuously, hundreds of times a second. Okay, So that actually is a good reason why Bluetooth is so easy to use is because of this advertisement feature. But it turns out that we can uniquely fingerprint all of you in this room. Okay, Each Bluetooth transmitter, just due to process variation and so on, has a PLL and a VCO, and the carrier frequency offset of that transmitter is unique uh, or has some unique properties amongst all of our devices. And so if we just go ahead and sample a bunch of commercial Bluetooth transmitters, what you'll find is that you have this kind of very clear and distinct amount of carrier frequency offset, or CFO, between all of these devices. OK, so what an adversary can do is learn this pattern, learn what your carrier frequency offset is, and track you. Even if you're doing things at the system layer and 
you know, modulating your uh, or changing your, your MAC address and, and, and all this stuff. This is a physical layer identification. And so an adversary can eavesdrop this and identify you and track you. Okay. It turns out it's a, even a little bit more complicated than that. It's not just carrier frequency offset. It's also IQ offset and IQ mismatch and so on. All of these slight, small, little non-idealities in your transmitters result after process variation and voltage and temperature variation and so on, result in kind of these unique signatures, okay? So this is not great for privacy reasons. So one thing we were trying to think of is can we confuse the adversary by randomizing these features? So what we did is we built a transmitter. Uh, there's nothing terribly special about this transmitter. It uses a sta standard IQ uh, signal path, uh, which is normally you wouldn't have to do that for BLE, but because most BLE implementations in, in cell phones today use a BLE Wi-Fi combo chip, they end up using an IQ architecture instead. And so basically what we did is we built a true random number generator that will generate a, a string of random bits, and we used that to adjust the IQ imbalance, IQ offset, um, and uh, carrier frequency offset of this you know, transmitter. Okay, so it turns out the specifications to do this, at least for carrier frequency offset, which is the objective of our first piece of work here, it's you know fairly stringent. We need to change our capacitors in our LCVCO by on the order of one attofarad, okay, which is very very small. Uh, but fortunately, there's a lot of good work in the literature talking about how to build good digital PLLs, and simply by switching in a capacitor. Uh, that's slightly, slightly mismatched from a different capacitor, we can get these very, very low capacitance values that we switch in. So we went ahead and built a chip that does this. Uh, it was uh, implemented in a 65 nanometer process. We didn't have a whole lot of chips to measure out of this MPW run, but we measured uh, three different chips. And what you could see here is that before you uh, obfuscated, your carrier frequency offset in red here was fairly tight, a fairly tight distribution. It didn't change a lot, and they were fairly unique as well. So an adversary could easily uh, sniff these out and, and identify who you are. But then when we turned on the obfuscation feature, every time we transmitted a packet or every time there was a MAC address change or something like this, you could just change that carrier frequency offset, thereby obfuscating what your underlying properties are and uh, provide you with a lot of privacy. So we went ahead and, and measured these. Uh, the results are shown here. Uh, the Bluetooth standard requires you to be within plus or minus 150 kilohertz of your nominal channel frequency. So as long as we're obfuscating within that ballpark, uh, we should be OK. And so we went ahead and uh, kind of put this into our model of how well an adversary could detect who you are. And if you don't do any obfuscation, uh, an adversary can detect with 80% confidence who you are within one second. So I've already identified all of you. I'm kidding. Um, but uh, with our proposed obfuscation techniques, we can increase that time to one and a half days. Okay, so it, so it takes, uh, with 80% confidence, it takes that uh, nefarious agent one and a half days to finally figure out who you are, uh, at which point hopefully you've moved to a different location or something like this. So this was kind of a fun project. Again, this was worked on uh, with Dinesh Baradia and Aaron Schulman. And there's some interesting new directions, I think, that uh, this project could take. The next thing I wanted to talk about uh, today is more of the work going on to the longer range uh, IoT systems. And it's interesting, because if you look at the standards that people use for long and short range systems, in terms of what the standards specify for required noise figure and sensitivity, if GSM, Wi-Fi, Mix, which is the MedBand radio, Zigbee, Bluetooth, all of their sensitivities aren't actually that strict as it relates to the standard. Narrowband IoT, which is a standard that is developed specifically for IoT, for long-range IoT applications, is much more strict than all of these. Okay, you need a very good noise figure from your front end. But Narrowband IoT is designed to be a low power standard. I mean, it's basically just stripped down LTE, which is probably not the right way to get to low power, but it's, you know, it's what we have. And so the challenge is, this has the strictest requirements. What can we do to help improve this situation? 
there's a lot we can do. We've done a lot of work on PLLs and receiver architectures and so on. What I want to share with you guys today is uh, an LNA that my student Hossein uh, designed and, and tested that has some pretty darn good performance um, that may be of interest to the audience. So if you start by trying to build a good low power LNA, you'd probably start with your classic inductively degenerated um, circuit, right? This is a, a standard uh, LNA architecture. And for good reason, you can get very good low noise figure uh, with this. Now, if you look at the requirements for the transconductance, you'll notice that it's inversely proportional to the value of inductor L1 here. So what this means is that you want to, uh, I'm sorry, uh, that's a typo. You want to maximize L1 uh, in order to reduce the power consumption. But due to parasitics from the pad and from the gate of the transistor and so on, there's an upper limit by which you can do this. And there's also a noise figure uh, uh, trade-off as well here. Right? So if you start with, say, a, a 15 nanohenry nano inductor on chip, you need a GM of, of 5.4 millisiemens. And if you increase that to, say, 56 nanohenry, your, your required transconductance does go down. Okay? So, but 56 nanohenry, that's very big to put on chip. Uh, th there's going to be some self-resonant frequency issues and so on. This is probably not a good idea. We probably need to stick to that lower range. And at that lower range, our LNA, to meet all the matching criteria and so on, needs to consume about 350 microamps, which for a low power application is way too much. Okay, so what else can we do? We can go to a common gate uh, low noise amplifier. And the, th this is very easy to build. You just you know burn some current and you can get an exact 50 ohm match, no problem. But to get that 50 ohm match, you need to burn something like 1.3 milliamps in a 65 nanometer process. And for that, you're going to, at best, get a noise figure of 3 dB. So that's not a good option either. So we can start to get a little bit more fancy. Maybe we can add some feed forward gain. So you, you, you put the, the, the signal into the source, and then you add a transformer to add some additional signal coupling to the gate of the transistor. And this can help. Uh, but we're still at kind of this, this metric of about 300 microamps uh, for the system uh, with a good noise figure, but way too much current, okay? So what this is telling us is that the minimum transconductance required by our, by our low noise amplifier tra transistor is limited by, in, in the latter case, the passive components, the turns ratio, the Q of this, and so on, okay? So instead of having the signal come in through the source, why don't we have it come in through the gate? This is actually probably a slightly better option. And if we do so, what we find is the input, um, the input resistance uh, of, the, of the circuit is now actually, it's still 1 over GM, but it's modulated by this turns ratio here, okay? which, which is kind of an interesting property. So if the turns ratio is 3, which is reasonable for an on-chip or an onboard transformer, then we can reduce our required uh, GM to 1.6 millisiemen, which gets us to about 100 microamps of current in a 65 nanometer process. That's not terrible, but it's still not where we want to be. Okay, so and, and you know our, our noise figure here is, is is pretty good, but we have this interesting trade-off where if we continue to increase the turns ratio, our required GM goes down, which is great, but the required or the eventual noise figure that you get goes up. So there's this kind of difficult trade-off. So the insight that, that we, we realized here is, you know, why do we have to have a turns ratio greater than one? I mean, intuitively, it would make sense you want a turns ratio greater than one. But if we, um, or sorry, but, but if it reduces, oh, I guess I've made this point already. Um, the idea here is to reduce the turns ratio less than one and get into this regime over here where, okay, your device GM requirement goes up, which is bad, we don't want to have to do that, but our noise figure goes down. Is there anything we can do to make up for this by adding an additional matching network? And in fact, there's a really nice benefit of doing this, okay? And the benefit of doing this is that as you get over here into this less than one turns ratio, yeah, the required GM goes up, but that's just to hit your 50 ohm match. What if you don't care about hitting your 50 ohm match right here because you're going to put a matching network in between there? And in fact, as your turns ratio goes down, your input impedance goes up, 
which allows you to build a matching network that offers higher voltage conversion gain uh, for free at no power cost, right? So this is potentially very, very beneficial. So here's kind of the, the, the structure we're looking at. We have this off-chip matching network going into this gate-driven, uh, uh, inductively coupled system. Um, and we do a bunch of math and, and do some optimization and analysis. I'm going to kind of skip those details. Effectively, we're using a turns ratio of 1 over 3. So instead of 1 to 3, it's 3 to 1. And what this allows us to do is have a GM less than 30 millisiemens, which in a 65 nanometer process is 3 microamps. 3 microamps. Okay, so this is very low power. And uh, if we do some more analysis, we can find that the noise figure can be less than 3 dB, despite the fact that we're kind of like, with our turns ratio the way it is, we're kind of like a common gate amplifier. But yet, the way that we've architected this gives us a less than 3 dB, ideally, uh, noise factor, noise figure. So the complete circuit we built uh, is based on a current reuse LNA architecture, uh, as shown here. We actually added a few extra features to this. We added an additional uh, transistor that we actually then coupled to the input signal. Uh, and, uh, and then we add our matching network and some feedback networks and so on. So this is kind of uh, eventually what we ended up building. We def designed that transformer on the PCB. Uh, it's relatively small, but uh, it was too large to put directly on the chip. There's a few other details that I'm probably also going to skip in the interest of time related to the linearity of this structure. It turns out that with this local feedback loop that we've developed along with this extra uh, tra transistor in place here that's also receiving the gate signal, um, we get a small uh, uh, linearity improvement and noise figure improvement by doing this. Okay. So we went ahead and built this. So we fabricated it in a 65 nanometer process. The measured power consumption of this LNA is 36 microwatts with all of that stuff in there. Uh, and this is operating in the 600 megahertz uh, narrowband IoT band. So here's the uh, sim uh, measurement results of the S11 and the S21. We're showing a gain of about 15 dB or something like this. Uh, S11 is well matched across the band. And the measured noise figure is right at around 3.2 dB, something like this. It goes up and down with the measurement, of course. Uh, this is all measured using our, our nice Keysight uh, equipment. Thank you. Um, and, you know, theoretically, we could have got a little bit better, but due to the losses in the passives and so on, you know, there's always going to be a, a little bit of extra noise in, in these architectures. And, you know, we're consuming 36 microwatts. Our noise figure is 3 dB, and our linearity is not bad, given the structure that we're using, uh, IP3 of uh, minus 8.8. Okay. So if you're interested, I have a large table of comparisons here with a bunch of LNAs that, that we took from, from the literature. It's probably hard to read this from the audience, but uh, let's just say that our um, uh, combination of gain, linearity, noise figure, uh, and power consumption uh, is a state-of-the-art result that we're very excited about. Okay. So to wrap up, I just want to always mention that there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on in the lab besides uh, the work on wireless technologies. We do a lot of uh, power management stuff. Uh, we do self-powered sensing systems. We do high dynamic range front ends, mixed signal architectures, energy harvesters. And just today, it just came out today, we have a new paper in Nature Communications on an ingestible sensor that can uh, monitor metabolites in real time in the gut and uses magnetic human body communication to wirelessly deliver that information to your phone. So with that, I want to thank all the students who do all the hard work and the sponsors for this research. Thank you very much. And I'll give myself time for maybe one, one question. Oh, can I? Uh, oh, I have Please, a, a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Uh, what, what do you think about the uh, emerging quantum quantum receiver, specifically on the NB-IoT noise floor in the air? Uh, I'm really curious to hear what you guys think about it. It's a very good question, uh, and I don't have an opinion formed on that yet. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm still kind of looking into it. Once you have, please come back to us, sure. because yeah. also in the FCC, uh, Peter knows that we're discussing that quite, uh, quite a lot at the moment. Okay, great. Thank you. Good idea.